many voices here. Um, so Nick asked me to kind of help introduce. He was not able to be here today. He had um, some family stuff going on. So I said, yep, I'll pop over and kind of just be the interface. Um, but we are going to talk a little bit about Forte Analytical, a little bit about Forte Dynamics as well. Um, Forte is a fairly young company. We just started our lab two years ago. Um, we focus primarily on recovery via deep leaching. Um, so that's kind of what we really do focus on, primarily gold, although we have branched into areas of copper, some rare earths, and applications therein. So a lot of what we do is say, let's look at extraction of gold, precious metals. So part of that is also looking at all of the physical aspects of what do you do with deep leaching? How do you check particle size? How do you check flows? And what's the analysis? Um, my background is the, in the analytical side. Um, so that's kind of where I come into it. We are doing uh, elemental analyses, or that's you know, carbon, sulfur, you need to know these for your extractions for precious metals. We also do um, ICP OES, so your, all your suite of elements. I don't know how many analytical techniques you guys are really familiar with, um, probably not your primary focus, but that is a topic of discussion. And whenever you're running a research lab, you do need to have the ability to say, did this work or not? Did we extract gold? Where did it deport? Did it not? So that's a lot of what we do as well. Um, so we have a couple locations. We have Fort Collins as our primary lab location. Uh, that's where we do most of our bigger testing. And recently we did move into a Wheat Ridge location. That's actually where I am. I'm building out a new lab, focusing primarily on fire assay and elemental, trace elemental from exploration samples. So all of those core drillings that you need, all the exploration data that you guys need, that goes through me. But uh, so we have that, and then we go into our MET processing. Um, so that's kind of what we're going to start with. But Nick will be presenting a lot more about Forte itself. And there is Nick, so he doesn't need too much introduction. He has some slides on that. But uh, I'll hand it over to Nick then. Um, and then questions afterwards, I will be here for as well, as, as will Nick. So thank you guys, and thank you for inviting us to speak. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, sorry for the, the complications, but thank you uh, for accommodating it. And thanks to Jess for presenting. Um, would have liked to have been down there, uh, but you know, things happen. Muted yourself. Uh, am I muted? Uh, one second. Or you might have the opportunity also. Um, uh, <laughs> this might also be quite a bit of fun. Uh, can you hear me now? No. Okay. Ah, it's good. Uh, it's on our side. It's my fault. All right. Now? No. Okay. All good? <laughs> Uh, all good? Am I good? Anything? Uh, am I good to go? Anything? Okay. Nick, I think you're good. All right, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, okay. No, um, yeah, sorry I'm not there, but thanks for accommodating this. Uh, thanks, Jess, for uh, standing in for me. Let me get some slides up and we'll go from there. <laughs> All right. Let me know when you can see that. Yeah, Nate, you're good. Okay, so I'll keep it in this mode. It's just easier for me to see what's going on. Um, but yeah, I really want to go through uh, both Forte Analytical, Forte Dynamics. Um, you know, we're kind of a combined group, engineering, consulting, lab testing, mine planning, uh, kind of the, the whole gamut. Um, I've heard, or, um, you know, 
uh, mine to mill, uh, I'd call us kind of pit to production, at least on the heap leach side. The, the lab tends to get it involved in a little bit more, um, more aspects of mining. But the, the, the focus around the, the majority of the group or the core of everything that we do is primarily around heap leach. Um, we are based out of North Fort or Northern Colorado, um, offices in Fort Collins, Loveland, uh, Lakewood, Salt Lake, and uh, Tucson at the moment. I think Reno as well. We've got a couple of people there. Um, but we were kind of a, a conglomerate, conglomeration of a number of different groups. Um, Forte Analytical, as just said, started a couple of years ago. Uh, we've recently acquired uh, RDI out of the Wheat Ridge uh, area, uh, Deepak Maholtra and his uh, consulting services and their lab services as well. Uh, Forte Dynamics is the engineering consulting arm of all of that. And then Open Contour is a mining software uh, similar to uh, I don't know, mine or any sort of mine planning, whittle shell kind of mine optimization scheduling program. Um, so we combine all three of those groups or all four of those groups now to work together in conjunction to kind of optimize a mine planning, heap leach stack optimization, uh, metallurgical optimization, you know, for a, um, a mine site or a, a new project. And, and really take it from, uh, we can get involved as early as exploration, particularly with the lab services, but ideally around the, the, the PFS, the FS uh, level of a project so that we can optimize the, uh, what the metallurgy is doing, optimize the mine stack or the, mine, the mining uh, schedule and the heap leach stacking aspects, and then work that into a, a, an overall optimized uh, value for the, the site. Um, uh, we'll start with kind of the, the Forte analytical look of things, uh, get into how that gets involved into the, the engineering side and kind of how uh, those blend together. Um, uh, but first I'll kind of introduce a, a bit of my background. Um, you know, you see the, the Montana Tech logo up there. I know it's um, may not have kind of the same competition between Montana Tech that, uh, or I guess feeling the same competition being from Montana Tech as, you know, being at CSM would. Um, but uh, do get involved with CSM now as well. Um, stayed with Montana Tech for I know, about a, a decade going through that process um, and have worked that into kind of a, a consulting and lab testing uh, kind of industrial experience and background. So starting out in Salt Lake with FL Smith, uh, working through to Forte Analytical now as our director of technical services, primarily as the, the primary consulting uh, with our, our clients. Um, also work fairly heavily as a volunteer with SME in a number of different areas. Uh, and I bring that up just to encourage all of you uh, out there to get involved with SME as well. Um, you know, really need to, to see involvement from a lot of the, oh, let me fix that right there first. Um, need volunteers to, to move a lot of these groups forward. And, you know, it, it may not be, um, there are a, a lot of other groups that, you know, don't have volunteers, student member affairs, um, young leaders is definitely another one to, to start to be involved in. Uh, I know there's a heavy presence with CSM members into that, uh, but there's a lot of benefit. And if you're looking to stay within the, the mining industry, you know, definitely a lot of good that you can do through there. Uh, qualified professional for mineral processing and also a cyanide code auditor. Um, okay, others that you'll or meet through the, uh, the lab met Jess Axon. Uh, she didn't want me to put this up here, but I did anyway. And then uh, Brittany Garcia, uh, at least a decade of experience with Freeport, brought her on to serve as our analytical director and now manages our, our Fort Collins lab facility. Yeah. So overall, uh, the, the lab really started out in support of Forte Dynamics, kind of around the heap leach testing. So bottle roll testing, column leach testing, 
and our diffusion leach testing uh, in order to kind of optimize that process. But since then, we've been able to expand into a number of different areas that you know, have allowed us to, to work with lithium boron clients, uh, to work with copper clients, uh, sulfide, um, min or industrial minerals. Uh, a lot of the testing ends up being the same or the equipment to test it ends up being the same, particularly on the analytical side. And so, uh, while our core focus still involves the, the Forte Dynamics clients, we, we do uh, end up bringing in quite a bit of other type of work. But, uh, on the analytical side, our primary focus is around uh, things that will impact uh, primarily a, a heap leach type operation. So in, in gold, that ends up being organic carbon, sulfide sulfur, um, base metals, and, and or if there's anything uh, you know, that rises to a, a level high enough to be considered uh, you know, deleterious. So copper, arsenic, uh, zinc, things of, of those nature. Um, metallurgical can go from, uh, we, let's say we routine, routinely uh, receive anywhere from you know, a, a five gallon bucket to uh, we've received upwards of 12 super sacks of material for a single sample. And they're able to, you know, break down rocks that are on the order of two feet uh, in order to, you know, get a, a pulverized assay material out of that. So uh, any or a full suite of samples come in for any number of different uh, analytical feed assay type uh, analyses. Also get into comminution uh, type testing. So crusher work index, abrasion index for crusher sizing. Um, ball mill sizing, that kind of thing. And then geotechnical, particularly around compacted permeability uh, to kind of understand hydrodynamics of a heap leach as material gets uh, stacked. So, you know, how that uh, flow path potentially changes and uh, does it eventually cut off. But, um, so more on, on the, the analytical a little bit, uh, as we build out, uh, particularly for just accent services, uh, full scale fire assay, high throughput, um, maybe not necessarily as high throughput as you know, some of the uh, production labs can be, but on the order of a, say a couple hundred samples per week uh, in order to uh, assist on exploration services. Um, and then those who are more familiar with the analytical equipment that we've got, um, multi-element determination done by ICP, uh, OES with ICPMS capabilities coming up, uh, and then AA primarily on the, the cyanide side, but um, you know can do single element AA analysis for most um, elements as well. And then copper sulfur speciation uh, done by LECO, so a, a combustion methodology that detects uh, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, off-gassing uh, once a salt or once a sample is roasted. Uh, getting into geotechnical, you know, can get into uh, a number of different things outside of the compacted permeability, but uh, more so an evaluation of how durable or how strong a rock material is. Will it degrade, um, you know, if it's immersed in water? Uh, will it abrade? Does it, uh, or will it impact the liner that the, the heap leach is placed on? Uh, so a number of different things, more so around the physical characteristics of the rock and how it interacts, um, you know, over a, a, say, projected extended period of time. Uh, one of the, the shots inside of our lab, you know, this is our sample prep area, everything, uh, particle size distribution, uh, splitting, crushing, kind of all of the same standard stuff that you'd see in most labs. Our column facilities uh, run anywhere from a four inch diameter to a current 12 inch diameter column and anywhere from five foot to 10 foot uh, in height. Looking to, to run ROM style columns, so anything two feet to three feet in diameter, uh, 10 to 20 feet high, just haven't had the, the call to do so yet. Our analytical group capabilities, um, you know, outside of the, the equipment mentioned before, we do get into bioconsulting as well. Um, you know, not that there's a, 
that there's been a decent amount of interest uh, industrial. And I know there's more of an interest academically, but groups like Jetty Resources, um, trying to think of uh, a couple of others that are currently working in the, the bio mining type arena, but um, blanking at the moment. Anyway, uh, so number of different aspects that we get into or get involved with our clients in, and you know, not necessarily just a straightforward type uh, process or projects. Um, you know, looking at bio extraction of phosphate, a client that was looking to produce what would be considered a environmentally uh, sustainable phosphate product um, if it's if the sulfuric acid for the leach is generated. Um, uh, uh, I guess, bio style, looking at, you know, how a, a gold or a silver leach extraction rate is impacted by higher levels of wad cyanide uh, and what that, you know, kind of recirculating load ends up uh, doing for process considerations. Um, you know, alternative lixivians for polymetallics, so copper gold operations being a I'll, at least going forward, something that needs to be solved to a better degree. You know, high copper with a nuisance amount of gold, uh, or I guess saleable amount of gold, uh, or, you know, vice versa, uh, a primary gold mine with a nuisance amount of uh, copper becomes a uh, significant economic uh, issue where either you're looking to increase your cyanide consumption to con or to compete with that copper uh, and then try to produce a product at the end, um, or you just try to uh, avoid it at all costs. But as more copper gold deposits come up or come up for uh, consideration, it's something that needs to be developed. Uh, carbonaceous ore, uh, a major issue throughout most of Nevada uh, into other you know, other types of mining, but low grade, high organic carbon type operations. Uh, there's, you know, millions of tons of this material out of or in Nevada at most operations and currently being wasted. So is there another way to get uh, around that car or that organic carbon? Um, and, and so, you know, with some of these, you know, what do we, what do we do with the the analyses that we get. Um, you know, at, since we're not just a production lab, we tend to add in some consulting along with the, uh, the test work that we do in order, in order to, you know, provide that additional value to a client. Uh, one of the things, you know, we look at on the uh, sample preparation side is the particle size distribution. From a, a heap leach perspective, you know, we, we look at whether or not that material needs to be agglomerated uh, in order to maintain a, uh, you know, a, a decent permeability in the, the heap, particularly as you get into stacking of ore, you know, two, three, 400 feet high, you know, can you still maintain flow through the bottom of the pad? And so uh, as we look at a particle size distribution, you know, we tend to look at how much material is passing the 200 mesh screen uh, for whatever that crush size may be higher than 20% and, you know, we'll flag that as a potential, you know, material that's going to blind off a, a, a heap leach pad. Not that it necessarily uh, is guaranteed to do so, but this initial test then gives us the ability to recommend, you know, do we look at preliminary agglomeration? Do we look at compacted permeability for a material to say, or to then say, you know, this, this either needs agglomeration or it doesn't. Um, then looking at uh, preg rob again, or organic carbon levels and how that material, um, you know, preg robs. The, the standard preg rob test that's done for most, um, you know, uh, across the board really isn't standard uh, from lab to lab and really doesn't, um, you know, give the full picture of what amount of gold is going to be, you know, stolen by this organic carbon that's present. And so we tend to look at a, a cutoff that we provide to clients, you know, 0.1% carbon, 0.2% uh, organic carbon. Uh, it will vary from site to site, depending on how active that organic carbon may be. But the threshold typically ends up being about 10 to 20% uh, gold preg rob being you know, the, the cutoff for what you'd want to send to a heap leach. And 
operations can change that. They can do what they want. Uh, we do see uh, a number of clients will throw on higher levels of preg rob or without knowing it, throw on samples or, or that has significant levels of uh, preg rob and then uh, aren't able to complete their monthly met balances. Well, when you go back into it and look at some of the, the material, uh, whether it was tested or not, um, you know, you find that uh, a lot of operations, you know, tend to have placed preg rob material and what the, the standard is for estimating it, it uh, estimating what that loss may be, uh, typically uh, or almost guaranteed tends to underestimate what the losses are. So uh, organic carbon, uh, we end up pushing this quite a bit with, uh, particularly with clients in Nevada, but uh, across the board, just to make sure that they understand at what those levels are and what that cutoff needs to be. Um, the, the typical, I'd say, uh, or what's typically used is, you know, if it's black, don't put it on the pad. Uh, but visually trying to determine, you know, levels of organic carbon at 0.1, 0.2% typically, you know, can't be well done by a geologist in the field. And so, you know, while, you know, something that's 1% organic carbon is pretty, pretty commonly uh, or pretty often uh, very black, easy to see, some of these lower levels aren't and can still be problematic. So, uh, almost, you know, getting to the point where we recommend a, uh, either a total carbon or an organic carbon, um, you know, model within a deposit. Uh, and then we get into kind of the, the leach aspects of what we do. And uh, while uh, for a heap leach, you know, a bottle roll testing, column leach testing campaign is fairly common, we prefer to recommend a diffusion leach test, uh, similar to a column leach test, uh, but instead of a continuous dripping system, the, uh, the ore that we test is, uh, I'd say the solution is stagnant, but it's a 100% solution to rock contact so that the, um, you know, the, the rocks are immersed. We tend to set or separate individual size fractions of rock. So we'll test a two to three inch material separate from a three to four inch material, separate from a half inch material, and then evaluate the leach rates of each of those individually and then build back what we would expect a full particle size distribution of that material to be. That, it starts to take into account the, uh, the competency of a, a rock or an ore type, um, you know, the, the path into the, the rock and back out, where the gold is typically located within that material. And so we end up getting a, uh, a more, I'd say, discrete leach rate, um, you know, for individual materials. And we can test larger scale materials or larger size materials uh, individually than would be able to be tested in a column. What we end up building back out of that uh, are these leach curves. Each of these uh, curves end up representing a different sized material. And then from that, we can build uh, from a Bruno model or a, you know, some sort of estimated PSD for a operating uh, heap leach, you know, uh, what that leach rate ends up looking like. So kind of a, a mass balance based on the leach rates of the individual particles. But as a site goes to, you know, consider different crushing operations, you know, we look at how that uh, leach rate can then change or, you know, as a material or as a site goes into operation, you know, we can project the difference between a half inch to a three quarter inch crush as that goes onto the pad, then track that in the, the model that we, uh, the Forte Dynamics ends up using. And that kind of ends up being the, the, the blend or the bridge between the data that Forte Analytical produces and goes into the Forte Dynamic model. So from that, Forte Dynamics then takes that projected uh, leach kinetic curve, you know, for a particular material. And as it gets placed onto the pad, able to track the solution flow through that material over time, and then model that to produce kind of a, a time-based or production, um, you know, for the site. And taking into account the, the material coming out relative to its grade, is it going to be better to place it you know, uh, higher up or closer to the, the bottom of the pad to get that material quicker? 
And so uh, a lot of the optimization ends up being around, you know, not necessarily changes in overall production of gold, but the time production of that. And so gold that's produced quicker ends up being worth more than say coming out 10 years later. So how does that get optimized? And that's a lot of what goes into the model. Um, and there's a lot that it'll uh, has the capability to end up discreetly tracking. And so as material comes out of the mine, excuse me, out of the pit and gets placed onto the, the pad, that or the, the ore type, the grade, uh, the leach kinetics of that, um, any, any mineralogy that goes into that is tracked into the discrete areas of the, the heap leach pad. Um, excuse me. We can skip that one, but so it ends up creating discrete blocks within a heap leach pad uh, to identify, you know, total contained gold, total extractable gold, what that timeline to extract the gold is. And then it's more projected over the entire uh, life of mine or the life of the, the pad. What we end up looking at is, you know, areas of either concentrated gold or, you know, hot spots for where that may be. If we go back and look at a, a heap that's already been operating, we can go back, take a look and see where we think the, the most, um, you know, recoverable gold may still be, um, you know, for, based on what a mine has produced, what they've stacked, what they've leached, how long a material has been leached. We can go into those kinetics and then start to predict or project, you know, areas of potential, you know, re releaching for higher production. And then, or we're able to take that, we calibrate it based on, you know, historical operations uh, for uh, for operations that already are, you know, sorry, excuse me, for existing operations, able to go back make that model uh, calibrate to you know, what's been produced already and then project it going forward. So it ends up being a fairly tight process and we're able to keep it uh, fairly close. Uh, we can track solution inventory as well. So not necessarily just what's been produced, but what's left in the pad when it goes to be washed or rinsed. Um, you know, what's left at each lift, what's left within each block uh, potentially but trapped in solution uh, and hasn't come out of the pad yet. So there'll always be a discrepancy between what's placed what's or what's produced and what's still left in the pad at the end of it. All of that ends up leading into a couple, you know, potential trade-offs. Um, you know, this is where it comes into the PFS, the FS level. So being able to look at, you know, what's the optimal crust size? Is it a tertiary crust system? Can you go to a, a ROM crush or I guess not ROM crush, but a ROM placement of material uh, and avoid having to you know, pay out the capital for the crushers? Uh, in this case, looking at you know, where the placement of the material goes, um, you know, do you place an intermediate liner? Do you uh, expand the pad? Do you uh, build the pad higher? So a lot of these different trade-offs end up, you know, determining what your or what the quickest uh, production of gold is going to be. Not necessarily that there's a significant change at the end of the life, but during the, the early stages of it. We can also look at you know, how the, uh, the solution flow goes um, you know, for materials that are higher clay bearing or have a lower uh, solution permeability. Um, you know, what we can do to, uh, I, I guess, optimize the solution flow of that over time, particularly. So looking at reducing the application rate uh, and increasing the, the potential solution inventory or the, the overall production, what those kind of trade-offs look like. <clears throat> By the end of it, uh, you know, we've, I want to say overall, there's about 50 of these models in place, um, you know, Mexico, Nevada, Yukon, um, Eastern Europe uh, at this point. And at, at some point, uh, almost all of these models have been able to provide some amount of benefit to the overall NPV. And it, it's you know, anywhere from a 1% or 2% to a 20% increase in over or overall NPV is fairly substantial. Not that that's necessarily always, you know, always comes true through the life of it, but at least able to project a better operational uh, or better heap leach stacking plan or a better mining plan in order to get to some level of consideration to improve upon it.
That's why it's particularly uh, more beneficial to get this done at the PFS or FS level, but also able to, you know, potentially look at it from a, uh, a heap leach that's been in existence and looking to, to modify how they do things going forward. But, you know, so looking at that, that's the, the analytical side through to the engineering, uh, overall the, the modeling that comes out of it and what the, the group ends up doing. Um, so I guess with that, uh, any questions? Um, Nick in terms of uh, you guys tracking the grade and moisture contained form of ash, how are you guys modeling that? So the, the grade comes out of the, the exploration uh, or blast hole kind of uh, information that's provided from the, the site. Uh, particularly up front, it'll be based on the, the initial geological model, you know, the, the grades that have been provided for that. Um, the, the model then gets calibrated with the blast hole grades um, that get provided, you know, from the site afterwards. Oh yeah, no, I, I'm sorry, I got that part. And then after you bleached it, how are you projecting where you expect the high grades to still have? Okay, so, you know, based on the, the leach curves that we have, uh, you know, we have it based on time. And so, you know, if a cell's been leached for 30 days, for 60 days, you know, we're able to estimate what that uh, leach rate is for each of the sizes, you know, for the, whatever the crush size of that cell may have been. And then, you know, project what or what may still be remaining in that cell. Okay. Do you guys ever drill to um, do any QHC on your estimation? Yes. Um, you know, so particularly uh, uh, up front, we recommend, um, you know, drilling to confirm it. And, you know, we've had or well, we've put wells into a number of different sites to go back in and re-leach some of these areas at a, you know, uh, better efficiency. So yeah, there, there is always going to be residual gold in most of these. Um, you know, and you can, particularly with the drilling, you can go back in and find spots that you uh, that may have been under leached due to compaction. Uh, you know, some sort of a blinding layer that helps to confirm. You know, how well a, an area was leached. So we can project based on production levels and. Uh, if possible, you know, if the, the heap is fairly well segregated in order to see production of areas, that's helpful. If uh, the entire heap is sampled off of a single, you know, um, preg line, then we have problems, um, you know, with that level of accuracy. But as much as possible, we can project it. But then, yeah, drilling definitely does help. Okay. And then in terms of your, your testing and optimization, are you guys also looking at rip depth? Uh, how much to rip it after placement or not so much? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? It's uh, a little quiet. Sorry, if you were laying a copper leaf pad and you wanted to rip it before you put the lines down, do you guys optimize rip depth or is that kind of up to the liner? Uh, sorry, thinking through that. Um, not sure I fully got the question. Normally, after you stack a copper leach pad, you compact it now with the tires of driving over it. And so the miner will go over and they will rip it with a dozer. Yeah. So testing, do you include any of that rip depth? Um, but, uh I think that's more of a, a operational feel. Um, you know, the, the deeper the ripping, probably the, the better, but I, I would assume it's more going to be based on the homogeneity of the material uh, and the, uh, I guess the compaction. So I think we've seen more uh, ripping due to temperature um, or, you know, issues with uh, low permeability than anything else. Uh, so if you don't have those issues, you know, Maybe not, but uh, I don't think we've got anything that can uh, optimize what that needs to be. Okay. I'm just curious. Thank you. I've got a question, Nick. If you're called in to troubleshoot or optimize the existing pad, do you typically do the lab tests first to develop your model again, or do you use, say, data that the miner provides you? So a lot of it ends up being how much money they want to spend, which typically ends up being not enough. 
Um, and so we will work with historical data primarily just because it doesn't cost them or as much, uh, but we will always recommend, you know, uh, testing in order to support that. Um, you know, often that's not always the case. In any event, I do want to compliment you on the model because 35 years ago, my company that worked with at the time in our own lab, we did the leaching by different sizes. Mm -hmm. Back then, we really didn't know what to do with ourselves. Well, I've got another quick question. So this is my yep. You talked about alternative lixiviums. Are you doing any work with thios or other cyanide alternatives? Thiosulfate still, you know, tends to be the biggest one requested. Um, the, the problem isn't necessarily with the leach on thiosulfate. It ends up being on the recovery aspects of it. Um, you know, there isn't a whole lot for thiourea, or thiourea that I've seen, at least on an industrial level. Um, and then I know there's a, a number of, you know, non-cyanide types that are out there. I think uh, what is it? Three Aces has indicated that they're using something like that. Um, you know, China has a number of suppliers of you know non-cyanide uh, lixivians, but they tend to work uh, better uh, with con or concentrate type materials, so gravity cons or e scrap. Uh, and I'm not sure, at least on the heat loot side, that anything's there for it yet. Well. One question. So when you're doing your heat leach for gold or copper, if it becomes refractory, how do you deal with that? Are you just gonna suggest like regrinding that portion of the heap or do you just increase concentration or what are some of the solutions you would take? You asked if it was uh, turned refractory? Yeah, if, if after a given time, like say 30 days, you're leaching and for some reason they added more carbon stuff or like sulfate formed in the particle and you cannot leach anymore. How do you feel? So uh, a lot of times in cases like that, you're either rehandling material if, you know, you haven't gotten far enough down the road with it or, you know, if you've gotten to the point that you've already stacked around it, stacked on top of it, uh, mm -hmm. You know, oftentimes it, it just ends up being a loss at that point. Um, so it really ends up, um, you know, benefiting you to understand all of this beforehand, uh, more so than trying to troubleshoot it after the fact. Um, often, uh, particularly with the heat, there's not a whole lot to do. So following that, because that will be reporting to your, like, trap gold or metal accounting on your model, right? Like, that could be part of the gold you can leach and will basically ever leach. So if you're dealing with historical data, do you need to resample those sections that are not leaching given your model? Like you give them a model and 30 days from now, it varies on those. Uh, like expect it to the actual, do you ever resample that to make sure it was repertory or it's just left. So uh, if it's, or being found out that it's, you know, refractory from the, the standpoint of a shift sample, um, you know, it might be something that you can catch. Um, you know, if that material ends up going to a stockpile, maybe you can reroute it. Uh, but that's if the, the site lab is able to understand that information in time. Um, you know, what I've seen typically is that lab sites um, or site labs typically cannot um, assay and, uh, and provide enough information in a quick enough time frame in order to do that. Um, once it's on the pad, you're basically stuck with what you're going to get for it. Uh, you may go back and do something, you know, later down the line. You're probably not going to worry about it, you know, at or in the, the early time frame, just because it, it's not uh, going to be worth it to go after, you know, something that's 0 0.1, 0 0.2 gram loss. Um, if it is a, uh, let me say that from a couple of different perspectives. So if it's refractory due to uh, silica or sulfide, 
Uh, sulfide, you may eventually get some of it out. Silica, you're just never going to get it out, you're, or it's likely uh, a loss to or a total loss. Pregrob would be something to potentially consider other options, uh, just because it it's not that you're not leaching the material, but it's going to actively steal or pregrob, um, you know, lifts above it. So if it's widespread enough, um, you know, that may be something that you try to take off or you reline, uh, line back over it so that you're not continuing to take additional losses. Okay. I have one more to follow up. So you have, there's two common assays for precious metals for gold and silver, and it's fire assay, and then you can go to AA or ICP. I know there's a great difference between those three. What would be more effective in a quick time frame? Like if you don't want to lose gold, for example, because now we might change. Yeah. I've seen more and more labs going towards a cyanide extractable assay rather than a total gold assay. Um, you know, so a cyanide shake ends up being something that can be done a lot quicker and a lot higher throughput than a fire assay. And it gives you, you know, an idea it, if it's worth going after. Uh, you know, a fire assay doesn't necessarily tell you if it's uh, ore grade or not. Although if you've got an understanding of the geology, then you can probably infer, you know, what that cutoff grade needs to be from a fire assay perspective. Um, I would say both are needed. Um, you know, the, the typical cyanide shake extractable gold to fire assay ratio will give you an indication of, you know, problems. So if that ratio ends up being 0 0.8, 0 0.9, there's no problem. But you don't know that if you don't have both pieces of it. If that uh, value ends up being, you know, say 0 0.5, 0 0.3, you know, it indicates that there's something going on that you need to be aware of. Um, but again, you or even if that, say, 0 0.3 cyanide shake to fire assay ratio um, shows an ore grade extractable level, you or you're not aware of what the problems are coming with it. So if it's high sulfide that's causing it, you're going to start to see more lime, um, you know, a need for more lime, more cyanide. Um, you know, if you're, or if it's silica encapsulated, not much you can do about it, but at least you're aware of it. So, you know, there are cut or there are shortcuts that can be taken, but it really uh, needs to be, there needs to be an understanding of the geology before that can happen. Okay, thank you. I was going to try and answer that one. <laughs> Is there anything you can share with us about exciting times in the lab? What do you like best about it? Um, well, I will say I'm pretty excited. We are going to have a fire assay lab up and running here within a couple months. So potentially maybe we'll have the opportunity for somebody they would like to come see a functioning working fire assay lab. Um, for all of you that are interested in precious metals, when you ask about AA versus gravimetric or ICP finish, um, to really kind of have the opportunity to see what that is, gives you a much better understanding of what you're actually looking at. So I'm pretty excited about that. We will have that up and running in the bridge within a couple months. So, you know, I can leave contact information. We can potentially discuss that. Nick, I don't know if we can do that or not, but um, maybe. Yep, we're gonna. I think we're providing a tour to the SME group or SME conference next February, so we better be ready for that. Well, I better be up and running before February. Um, but yeah, that's exciting for us, um, as well as getting our ICPMS. So that's your true trace elemental analysis. Um, I'm the nerd, the chemist, so I geek out on these things. So that's exciting for me. Um, and then just a lot of the work that's continuing to go on at Forte, um, learning opportunities there to kind of see small scale what these um, different processes entail, you know, so you can predict future forward on these large, you know, processes. That's pretty exciting. So there's my belief. Are there any other questions for Nick or Jeff? Oh, Nick, one final question. I don't know if you have a very special class this one. 
Uh, with respect to the uh, optimization logics of transition equations, you presented, uh, well, anything related to optimizing grades usually ends up in a nonlinear analysis. Uh, do you know if they are actually using a nonlinear solver for doing this, or if the system linearizing the problem and they just fix it? Sorry, I, I couldn't hear that one. I mean, uh, your solution for the optimization, uh, like routine that Porte has, is that linear, nonlinear? I'm sorry, I'm still having a trouble hearing. Optimization, you know, is your process a linear process for optimization or is it a non-linear? Uh, non-linear. And are you using a particular non-linear solver or are you linearizing the problem in sequence? Uh, trying to think. It all ends up being a, well, actually, I do not know. Um, the the or the programming that goes into it there's no particular uh program we use gold sim as a backbone for it but really it, it's all internal uh programming yeah my question was related because uh when you linearize you can be, you basically are no longer in the normal optimal solution so if your system works but you, you have no guarantee that it's the best solution mathematical solution at least so. okay. yeah. thank you thank you Well, thank you, Nick, and thank you, Jeff, for your time. Thank you. Um, if there's any other questions, you guys, please do email. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> I'm <laughs> <laughs>